Sorry. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Karen Wiseman again. Dr. Karen Wiseman is the Stumpel Fulcomer Professor of Homiletics at the United Lutheran Seminary in Philadelphia. And she's an ordained pastor of the United Church of Christ and has been a pastor in Kansas, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And in addition to teaching at the seminary, Dr. Wiseman is an author and a popular presenter. And we're very pleased to have you. Thank you. Um, and as we close out our liturgical year in worship, our scripture readings reflect a theme of the anticipation, anticipation of the final days, the coming of the kingdom of God and the return of Christ. And so we are encouraged to use our talents here and now for the well-being of others as part of this anticipation and reading. Um, but we've asked Dr. Wiseman to help lead us in discussion about what is this all about. So I welcome Dr. Wiseman. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I can't oh, see sorry. you. I know. I'm going to sit somewhere else. I have to sneak it's out right. a little it's bit. I've got this blind. I'm like, I can't <laughs> see somebody. Uh, which is why I turned around. Uh, hey, thank you all for having me today. Um, when Dottie called uh, during the summer and said, I've got two dates that I'd like you to pick. The first one wasn't bad. I was like, okay, I can do the sacraments from a Lutheran perspective. That's easy. Um, and then she said what the second one uh, was, uh, anticipating the end times. And I said, seriously? <laughs> and she said, yes, seriously. So I'm going to start with this blanket statement for myself. All right. I grew up uh, in the United Methodist Church. It's a Protestant denomination. Wesley started it after Luther began to sort of fracture uh, the relationships between the, the Roman Catholic Church and these other uh, denominations or these other sort of uh, entities began to develop because there was a different theology than uh, people understood uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the things that we know uh, is that the understanding of the, of the end times, of the rapture, has always been sort of clouded a little bit in mystery. And uh, it depends on how you read the text, how you read the signs, all right? So if I read the text as a literal text, this is exactly what's going to happen. These are the words of God. This is when it's going to happen. These are the signs that it's going to happen. This is what's going to happen as a result. If I read the text as a literal document, there is no one place where everything is described. If you come up with that theology, it is a combination of texts from Matthew, from Mark, from Revelation, uh, even from some of our Old Testament prophets. And so one of the things that, that has always bothered me about it is, you know, when, when the prophets of old wanted us to know what was going to happen, they told us through their dreams, right? That's how they were often described. When the Gospels were written and later uh, when some of the letters that had a couple of allusions to, uh, to end times or the end of things uh, happened, you really have to do some cut and paste. And when you cut and paste and choose what text you want to believe and how you're going to combine them, you can really say anything you want, right? I mean, you could just you could cut and paste enough that that you could make it wrong uh, for uh, uh, you know for, for you to raise goats because you might find several different texts about you know how, about uh, goats not being you know the sheep are good, the goats are bad, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so when I start thinking about the end times, it's one of those things where I don't think about the end times. You know, um, it wasn't a discussion that we had growing up. It wasn't a part of my tradition. It wasn't one of those things that uh, it was instilled in me so that I could be fearful of how I let how I lived my life. Right. And one of the things that has always bothered me is the folks who think in, and believe in the end times. Um, they already understand that many people are already under God's judgment, that we're already uh, probably have been chosen. Who's going to go and who's not going to go? Now, predestination is usually in pre Presbyterian theology, but then it really comes into evangelical thought, too. You're going to go. You're not going to go. And so there's these people that they choose you're not going to go. And maybe it's based on race and maybe it's, you know, based on sexuality or maybe it's race. Uh, on belief or whatever it is. Um, and so the, the problem becomes, how do we read the text? How do we interpret them without making them literal, right? For me, but like I said, I didn't grow up even understanding the end times because we didn't talk about it. I did a quick thing on Facebook this morning uh, and said, what do you think about the end times? 
And there are like, I don't know, 25, 30 comments uh, already. I want to read just a couple of them. Um, I don't. I don't no. think about the end times. I don't think the Bible is literal like some believers. I just believe in God's goodness. Uh, when it happens, if it happens, we on the other side will be without question of what happened and why. Um, I believe the end times will be when any person dies for whatever reason, that is their end time, period. Um, the second coming is hearing the word, receiving the sacraments, meeting Jesus in your neighbor. Um, I believe it's only the end of the beginning, world without end, amen and amen, that it is just the beginning. Uh, the end times, according to one of my friends, said they're behind us. Um, I don't think about it much. God's problem, not mine. The job is already <laughs> taken. <laughs> <laughs> um, about it at all, it's a complete waste of time. Um, I only have this moment. We only have this moment. That's all we can manage. A more important message. Sermon on the Mount. Today, I try to take the next right step. Um, and so, just uh, you know, we had some who were believing. We had some who are not. But the vast majority of the people that I know on Facebook are pretty progressive. They know who I am, uh, and and that's uh, that's just who I am and who they are, and they sort of are friends with me. So what the word is that sort of relates to all this is eschatology, right? Uh, eschatology is a theological phrase. It is a frame of thought, and it is a thought that is talking about death, judgment, and what's happening to us in the end. And so uh, when I got to seminary in 1993, uh, I went to my first class, and they started talking about the eschaton, and uh, I didn't know what they were talking about. I'd never heard that word, the language they were talking about, about end times, as I said, I didn't grow up with it. And I'm sitting there throughout the class going, I don't know this word, I don't know that word. So I bought a book that was a dictionary of theological terms. And I was so embarrassed by not knowing things that I would sit at the table and I would hold it under the table. And whenever they said a word that I didn't understand, I'd look it up. And I think that often is, is true when we talk to theological in, in our framework. But I wanted you to understand, there's a whole group that studies the eschaton. There, there are eschaton scholars who are looking at end times. But more than that, there are groups of Christians who have latched onto these end times and that is their basic frame of reference the end times are going to happen we're all going to be judged those who are good go up those who are bad go down the earth is destroyed and there's a new heaven and a new earth but we're up in heaven and um and like i said i just don't i, I don't think about that um what catholic theology says is that eschatology is defined as being concerned with the so-called four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And in Roman Catholicism, that's what they're taught, right? The end of the world, this is what's going to happen. You're going to die, you're going to be judged, you're going to heaven, or you're going to hell, period. And there was nothing like that. How many of you were raised sort of talking about the eschaton? Hey, Keith, Great to see you. Good to see you, Pleasure too. Healing. It's good to be seen. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Sydney was like, are you really going to go? And I'm like, yeah, I'm really going to go. Yeah. Hey, Sydney. Hi, yeah. Hey. Good to see you. You too. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about is sort of what <laughs> eschatology means and then what these four signs are. And so um, the end of the world is predicted by several world religions. And so uh, both Aramaic and non, excuse me, Abrahamic and non-Abrahamic faiths. So we know that Jews talk about end times. There's an end time in, uh, in Buddhism. There's an end time in Islam. There's an end time in several different traditions and they look different. Some of it is you're just being sort of lifted and back into the great entity out there. And, it, you know, your body is gone. You're just this, this soul rejoining all of the other souls. But there are some who believe that not when you die, you're going to bodily die. But then the second coming, your body will rise and you'll be in the same body, uh, but just in heaven. And um, I, I don't, I don't know. So I started this study saying, this is not something I think about. She's been saying that a lot this week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And there's a lot of people who've said it's coming. We're we're in the midst of it. It's here. <laughs> we're in the midst of it. it and there have like been throughout history people who have actually guessed what date. Do you remember? There's yeah, been yeah. all these different oh, traditions. Some of them cultish kind of traditions, and they have said the end time is happening on you know December 31st, 2020, uh, or it's mm -hmm. happening on you know February 2nd, uh, 2012. Right. And there have been these these end time cults many of them led by amazingly charismatic individuals who got a group believing in what they believe and they bought into the whole system. Uh, and there've been several groups that as a result have committed suicide together. Uh, there was a suicide cult, an end time cult in California. I can't remember what year that was, but they all committed suicide together because they thought the end time is here. If they commit suicide, they'll automatically then go up and be a part of uh, the new heaven or the to heaven. And every time they are they have predicted a date, um, it has not happened. Um, and, you know, we don't hear about those dates anymore, but there are constantly dates being thrown out there to conservative evangelical, to folks who are part of these sort of cultish groups. Uh, and, you know, every time it's wrong, the leader is like, well, something happened that, you know, that changed the dynamics or, uh, and some people- You didn't believe enough. Yeah, that, oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. You didn't yeah. believe enough, so it didn't If you believed enough, it would have happened, uh, which is just BS, but that's okay. Uh, so let's talk about what an evangelical perspective says, all right? And this is straight from uh, the Covenant Church website. So I'm going to tell you what they say. Let's distinguish between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture is at the beginning. The second coming is at the end. So for evangelicals, they believe the rapture happens, and then there is the second coming. In the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. In the second coming, he returns with his church. In the rapture, he appears as a thief in the night. In the second coming, every eye will see him. So they've got these definitions, these definite things of what we're looking for, right? And then they go on to say, um, he'll come before judgment in the rapture. In the second coming, he returns with judgment. Then comes the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. The word millennia actually means 1000. And finally, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth. This is quoted right off their website. So here's the deal. The next event is a rapture. It can happen at any moment. You must be ready because he is returning. So look up. Your redemption is drawing near. Hi. So they have these, this very strong and clear language, right? It is happening any minute now. So what happened after Jesus died? Did everyone just give up and say, He's not coming back. He died. No, they started preparing for the second coming. And many of those early Christians and followers of the way thought it was going to happen any minute now. You read texts and people are like, I thought he was coming. When is he coming? I thought he was coming. Why hasn't he come yet? Right. And one of the, the answers to that question is when anyone asks me, I'm like, above my prayer grade. Right. I mean, I don't know when Jesus is coming. But I don't believe that there is going to be this rapture where all the bad people get left behind and all the good people go up to heaven. But it's a language that people have latched on to because they want to know what comes next. As I read some of those off my Facebook feed, they were like, I don't think about it. It's not a part of my tradition. I have a, it's a waste of time. I, you know, We'll know when it happens or we won't. Um, and that kind of uncertainty for some people <laughs> is beyond their capacity. There is a growing number of people who want to be told what to believe. Mm -hmm. And they want to be told how to live and how to act and how to vote and how to be and who to judge and who is in and who is out. And, you know, th that blesses them and curses others. So you put into uh, our modern context, all of the, the ideas that sort of get espoused on cable TV, whether it's a presidential candidate or it is the current administration or it is any other group, they talk about the fact that right now we're in the midst of such turmoil that someone has to have the answer. And so someone rises up and says, I have the answer. I'm the one that can fix it. I'm the one that can make things right. 
And I'll tell you how bad things are. And I'll tell you who to blame for it. <laughs> and if we do that, then we know who's in and who's out. We'll perpetuate this sort of exclusion of those that are different. And there have been lots of people who have risen to that state to be able to say, I'm the one. I'm the one. Maybe not using messianic language, but clearly saying, I am the chosen one to lead. And it's happened in other countries, and it's happened here. And all of that is sort of becomes more a cult of personality. But that cult of personality with all the answers draws in people who want to know the answers to the question. And some of them, they get drawn in because they don't even know what question stands. And all of a sudden, there's somebody saying, I'm the one. I'm the one. And that's one of the things that is so problematic about this language is you can twist and turn it just like they have to create this rapture, uh, second coming sort of a dichotomy. And they believe it's going to happen any second. And so we have to be ready. So they talk about four signs of the end times. All right, first, the sign of deception. Matthew 4, uh, four uh, Matthew 24, 4 and 5 says that false teachers will rise and the people will look to them to leave. False teachers, and they will claim to be the only one, as I said, to lead and that they are chosen by God to save the people. This sign, many people already believe, has happened. <laughs> it's always happening. Yeah, yeah. It's always happening. and it's always happening. There is somebody in almost every age, in almost any decade, in almost any you know part of the world that has said, "I'm the answer." And sometimes that "I'm the answer," I can help us get through this time, has actually worked. Right? Winston Churchill took the World War II burden of the British people on his shoulder and said, "I can get us through this." And he did. There are many people who believe that JFK was the answer. And when he was shot, within days, the anniversary, this is the 19th and two days, the 22nd, they believe that the answer got sort of taken away from us. And that America lost its innocence. That we sort of had, a, we'd been through this age that we'd come out of and we're in a really much better state. And, and the answer had come about, even though he was Catholic. <laughs> so deception happens all the time religious leaders deceive the people say we have all the answers for me growing up as united methodist at a very progressive sort of congregation that my dad you know led um i was very bothered by the catholics and the the southern baptists and very evangelical folks who were talking about a very different God, a God that was of judgment, a God of death, a God, you know, who's punishing a God, you know, and it was like, can we get him off the cross? You know, and it was all about Jesus died for your sins and look how, how bad you are. And, and Jesus did that for you. And, and it was just so overwhelming to me to hear that from my friends. And I heard some of my non-Catholic adults in my life who talked about the fact that the Pope was a deceiver, that the Roman Catholic Church was a deceiver, and that it was one of the reasons that we they thought we were in the end times was the prominence of the Roman Catholic Church all around the world, right? And I'm hearing that in the 1960s, 1970s, and, and you know, into the end of the 80s, and it was the Pope is evil, and then it was whatever religious leaders. And let's not, you know, we've had this in the past. Hitler said he was the answer. Mussolini said he was the answer. Stalin said he was the answer, right? Uh, Pol Pot said he was the answer. All of these times in our history where someone has claimed to be the one who has all the answers. Now, is that a religious connotation or not? It often is not. But we take it on because it's someone who says, I can fix your problems. I mean, Hitler swept into power saying, those are the enemy. Those people are the ones to blame. Those are the people we have to get rid of. Those are the ones that are vermin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. You heard that last week in yeah. New Hampshire. That's the language. Adolf Hitler talked about, Adolf Hitler talked about vermin. Yeah, yeah, to save us from World War III. Yeah, to save us, yeah. 
Um, but these, you know, people have risen up like to to say, okay, yeah. uh, I'm I'm the guy that's gonna you know ha make it happen or tell yeah. you when it's gonna happen. Yeah. And then of course it doesn't happen. The end time doesn't come. Yeah. I mean, don't people figure it out that <laughs> at some point they do, and people leave these. They, people, begin, you know, they begin to draw back. But there are some who are so susceptible to this sort of deceit becoming true for them that they don't have the capacity. They don't have the capacity to differentiate between this is bad. I'm being led down a path. They've been wrong again and again. I've got to get out. That's a hard, that's a hard thing to do for a lot of folks. That's why cults, cults of personality are whole, are very difficult to get people out of. Um, you can sit in front of a room of uh, Trump supporters and show data of how things went in the 2020 election, and they will continue to sit there and, and say, didn't happen, that it was, you're, you're telling me lies. It doesn't, because they've been lulled into this cult of personality, this belief that the deception is not deception, the deception is truth. And I think some would have walked away, but we're already seeing that his numbers are climbing even now among you know conservative evangelicals and folks mm -hmm. who might have been swayed uh, in the last election. They may not be. I mean, we're talking eight years, nine years, of uh, right, eight years, seven years, yeah, of uh, of being told these things and who to blame and what's going to happen, and and that's deception. Well, so don't you think some of it too is? I've bought right. fully into this. And if at some point I say it's wrong, I'm admitting I got duped. Yeah. And I can't, yeah. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. I can't say it's wrong because yeah. then I look like an idiot. Yeah. yeah. It, also, Go ahead. it was also said that um, I'm feeling lousy about myself. I'm truly a loser. And so is he. And I'd like to follow him, see yeah. how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think there's just, there, there are people out there that just want an answer. And one of the things that I loved about the statement of faith that Gloria Day had, and we say it, it we said it every Sunday while I was there, and it is, uh, this is a place where the questions are more important than the answers. Mm -hmm. And it was really important part of their identity to allow questions mm -hmm. and not to always have the answers. And so there were times when I literally preached and said, I'm not sure I know the answer. And so let's continue to search for this together. And for the most part, that was okay. There were a few people like, no, give us the answer. <laughs> and I think that's just a sign of our times. You know, we live in complicated times. And when you live in complicated times, it's hard. Um, so the second sign is war and rumors of war. And that is also in Matthew 24, 6 and 7. So it's one nation rising against another. Um, and what the book of Revelation does is it, give it gives it a little more credence because it talks about this war evolving to include all nations in the time of tribulations. And it's descri described as a ceaseless, unending, terrible war. Now, there have been continuous wars going on for 2,000 years. Uh, there is not a time when there was not war happening on our earth. It may be wars that we knew about, but once uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, my mind is blanking. Once the Gaza and Israel conflict sort of took center stage, we don't hear about the U Russian invasion of Ukraine anymore. We don't hear about, you know, some of the African countries and, and East Asian countries. They're in conflict. There are leaders who are trying to, to get it. Uh, to gain control in military conflict with the people. And, and it's happening all over the globe, right? Yeah. There's a, a meme that I've seen. I've actually shared it several times on Facebook uh, where you have these hands and the earth is sitting on it. And it says, I prayed to God that um, to touch the places that hurt. And God said, hold the entire earth. Uh, mm -hmm. it's all hurting right mm -hmm. and so this 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 idea of nation against nation world war one world war two the missile crisis all of these other times we're in the midst of a significant global conflict this is the sign that most so if you got false leaders and then you have wars upon wars 
And the Israeli and Gaza conflict is so complicated um, because Palestine had its own state. It was its own nation, right? Until all right. of a sudden it got taken from them and given to, uh, to, the, to Israel, to this new nation. And we went to Israel, uh, Palestine. We chose to go with the group that only spends money in Palestine. They don't stay in Israel. The only time we go into Israel is in and out to the airport uh, and to get to the old city. But that, you know, you can get there. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we chose. We did not want to spend money in Israel. Um, and for us, it was solidarity with people whose land was taken and continues to be taken. And we went through areas in Palestine and our guide, uh, Souk would say, um, this right here up on this hill, do you see this massive complex? And it is 700 apartments. Mm -hmm. And we're like, wow, is that where Palestinians live? Oh, no, 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 no. no. This is a new Israeli settlement. And it was everywhere we went. There were these places where it was Palestinian land had been set that way when Israel was established uh, in the late 50s. I think it's, is it 57? 48. 48. 48, sorry. Why do I think? Yeah. Um, and so the, the land Swiss that was cheese. divided, yeah. Huh? They call it Swiss cheese. Yeah, it was Swiss cheese. It was, here's a part, this part is Israel, this part is, is Palestine, this part, you, you know. And it's, the, just when, sure, sure. Where the Palestinian settlements are, that's where the water is. They didn't just oh, arbitrarily. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's no the, water available to yeah. Palestinians. It's all in the settlement. Yeah. That's despicable. Yeah. And so when we were in the West Bank, which is the biggest part of what is Palestine today, uh, and the Gaza Strip, which we hear a lot about, uh, um, we were up in the West Bank. We did not go to Gaza because it is almost impossible to get in there. And once you get in there, you may not be able to get out. The, and that was true before everything. Was oh, yeah, that was before, before all this, right? Yeah. Um, one of our, our friends in Palestine, I got to look at the time, one of our friends in Palestine, uh, he has a great aunt who has cancer. And um, they had to, and this was three years ago, they had to get a Palestinian doctor to do the documentation that she had cancer and needed surgery. They had to apply to the Israeli military to get a pass to go out of Gaza to an Israeli hospital where they had uh, the, the possibility of helping, but they also had to have an Israeli doctor say, I believe the surgery is necessary and let's make a way for her to have this surgery. And that was three years ago and she still has not had the surgery. Oh, and the cancer has continued to grow and all they know is she, it, and we, I have not checked in with that particular person. We've checked in with another, a, a number of people we know in Palestine. And um, so three years with a tumor growing in her body uh, and still no chance to get out. And the tunnels were built, yes, for some of the fighters, but a big part of the tunnel system was built to get stuff in because you cannot get anything into Gaza. Uh, you know, right now they're letting stuff come in the Rafa gate, but very limited. Um, and, you know, this conflict has gotten other world countries sort of engaged, right? So China and Russia and the U.S. and, you know, the East, the, uh, the Western Europe and all of these nations are in the midst of how does, how, what happens if this escalates? You know, um, I can be pro-Palestinian and anti-Hamas. Mm -hmm. I can be pro-Israel, mm -hmm. but anti-Netanyahu and his bombing mm -hmm. uh, of the people of Gaza. And that's hard for people mm -hmm. to hold those distinctions because a lot of people are like, every Palestinian is part of Hamas. And it's just not true. Mm -hmm. Or every Israeli wants to bomb the hell out of Gaza and get rid of Hamas. And the most difficult thing for all of this is to remember the people. Right? On October 7th, what Hamas did was despicable. It was evil. It was barbaric. The Palestinian people didn't do that. Hamas did that. What Israel is doing, bombing into areas where they know are hospitals and bombing ambulances and bombing apartment buildings where they think one Hamas leader is and killing you know, 50 other people. That is despicable. 
Now, what you begin to see with these claims, these signs, is that you can twist it to make it feel like it's happening anytime you want. So the next sign is the sign of devastation. It's a time of famine, pestilence, and earthquakes. That's all the time. Right? So uh, Matthew 24, 7 says that we will not be able to feed uh, uh, or save the masses. Guess what? We're not feeding or saving the masses. Mm -hmm. Famine is still prevalent in many, many uh, uh, countries in, in Africa, in Eastern Europe, uh, even in uh, Eastern, uh, the Eastern uh, Middle East and into the Eastern parts of the world. Most of these famines are uh, self-imposed in some ways because military dictatorships take on all of the food that they bring in and they very selectively give out very little of it, which is one of the fears that people had about giving anything to the uh, into um, Gaza because Hamas would take all of it and they wouldn't give it to the people. Uh, and one of our friends that we checked in with he said that his his his, his cousin, his uh, grandmother, and his aunt are all in Gaza. They lived in Gaza City. They were given four hours to escape. Couldn't get out fast enough. Couldn't get their stuff together. Couldn't get a car. Couldn't get through the traffic. Uh, moved as far south. And now Israel is bombing uh, the southern part of Gaza as well. And there's no food. Uh, we have this, you know, continued pestilence, you know, that happens in the world. Sometimes that's self-afflicted. Some people think uh, that uh, that might even be a part of COVID, that that's a part of that spreading uh, of, uh, of disease. And uh, there actually has been a lot more earthquakes and volcanic action uh, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. And a lot of that is caused by climate change. But if you're sitting there waiting to see this sign happen, this sign is happening, right, all around us. And then the last sign is of deliverance into tribulation. And that signals a growing animosity towards Christians, Jews, people of God. Matthew 24, 9 describes, they will hand you over to be tortured and will put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. We are going to be punished for our faith. Basically, what it says is that we will not uh, be seen as positive, that there will be animosity against us. And I think about over the last 20 years and the fact that until eight years ago, I could not publicly be out. The only language that you heard around homosexuality was negative in the church, and it still is. And when they talk about issues, they bring on the most conservative people from Family Research Center or something like that. And they have one narrow perspective about, uh, about uh, uh, LGBTQ issues. Uh, my third book is at the publishers now, and it's called Queering the Pulpit. And it's about how we preach in positive and affirming ways and how we bring folks who have been wounded by the church back into a sense of, of faith and and a connection to God, not necessarily they come back into the church, although that, that would be nice, but the wounds are so deep. Yeah. Um, and that's what led me to do this, is that there is just so much animosity still. But there's animosity towards a lot of people. And, you know, you think about refugees and the way that we think about the southern border. And you think about, you know, like I said, the LGBTQ community. You think about all these different groups that are set up as the enemy. That causes so much conflict. What we're having on college campuses right now, uh, you've got folks who are pro-Palestine and folks who, you know, is, as soon as you say I'm pro-Palestine, it means you're a follower or you believe in Hamas. Mm -hmm. And the other way, and there's been violence breaking out and there have been Jewish leaders who've stripped all these universities and colleges of their of the money that they give because of, they have, because of the anti-Semitism uh, that they see. Um, and that is a part of this this sign that the people of God, which includes Jews and 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 Islam, and Muslims and Christians, that we are hated by others, and that's happening in some parts of the world. It's happening in some places. And how do we deal with that? Well, the way we deal with that is that everyone is going to be punished, and those of us who have been the best, 
get to go up, right? Get to go on. So let me tell you something. Uh, John Nelson Darby, who was a British preacher, he actually invented rapture theology 200 years ago. It had never been a part of the, the theological framework. It wasn't a part of the early church. It wasn't a part of the Middle, Middle Ages. It happened in, let me see, I gotta find the, the date. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it was about, I think it was 1830 or something like that. And he developed this rapture theology. And he did it because he wanted people to be in fear of how they would be judged so that they would start living their life right. And so the only way he could come up with it was taking a literal reading of several different texts. So he took Matthew 24, which we've referenced several times today. Jesus says that there will be destruction, there will be wars, there will be all these things. Take a couple of, of Paul's letters, a couple of snippets from there, <clears throat> take some snippets from Revelation and put it all together. And he created a chronology of how things are going to happen. That in the thousand years, Jesus will be back, right? And then we'll have this rapture for seven years, Jesus is going to reign. And all of that came about from someone who was trying to start a church, who was trying to get people to believe in this chronology so he could keep them in that unstable state so that they would continue following, right? Do you get that? Mm -hmm. So he invented it. Um, and Darby took a traditional under, understanding of Jesus' second coming and divided it into two parts. The rapture first, when Jesus said, uh, when Jesus would hover above the earth and snatch born again Christians up to heaven for seven years, that some will be taken and some will be not. Remember the Left Behind series? Yeah. That came right out of this theology. That two people will be in a field, and guess what? It's scriptural as well, that one would be taken and the other would be left. Right? Uh, I saw a picture. Oh, my gosh. This was probably 10 years ago. Of this <laughs> neighborhood that had all their Christmas decorations up and they all had like, you know, blow these blow ups and stuff. Like that. <laughs> and there was this one family and they had set up like the whole family, there were four of them. And they set up these clothes on the yard, right? That looked like they had been taken and <laughs> their clothes were left behind. And they had this big sign behind it. You guys stay and celebrate, you know, around a tree. We're already gone. Uh, we're already with, uh, with Jesus. And I thought that is perfect uh, because it feeds right into that left behind sentimentality. Uh, and, you know, that's one of those things that it's, it's just problematic. Because when you think about rapture theology, in, the, in, in that, it means God is going to destroy the world as we know it. The world that God created and said, it is good. Now, we leave that, and then we go to the flood story, where God said, the world's not so good anymore. The people are not so good anymore. Let's get rid of everybody. And then you get to rapture theology, and for them, it makes perfect sense. When God gets tired of us and our folly and our fuss and our idiocy, God's just going to destroy the world. And scripture actually promises a new heaven and a new earth. But for me, it does not mean that it, there's going to be some replacement. It means that there will be an evolution for me that will become more loving, that will be coming uh, closer to God, closer to the divine. And um, Lutherans actually do not believe in any sort of Lutheran millennial kingdom of God status. It, it just, just doesn't believe it. Did you have you learned it growing up as Lutherans? No, we don't, we, that's not a part of Lutherans. The Lutherans teach that at death, the souls of Christians are immediately taken into the presence of Jesus, uh, where they await the second coming of Jesus on the last day. And on that last day, all the bodies of the dead will be resurrected. That's that bodily resurrection that will happen. Now, their souls will then be reunited with the same bodies they had before dying, and they will be changed, those of the, of the wicked, to a state of everlasting shame and torment, those of the righteous to an everlasting state of celestial glory. And after the resurrection, all of the dead and the change of those still living, all the nations shall be gathered before Christ, and he will separate the righteous from the wicked. So while there's not a rapture of theology in Lutheranism, there is an end time. There is a time of judgment. But as I said, most traditions do not teach that. They just sort of avoid it. Or our theology has evolved so much that even though that's a basic tenet in some faiths, they're just like disavowing it. Or they're, you know, if we put it in the closet over there, 
uh, no one will see it. <laughs> we won't have to talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I was never taught about that too separating yeah. the wicked, yeah. never. And because my God, being growing up Eastern, was always merciful. Like yeah. just for me, mercy negates all of that. Yeah. So yeah. I don't get it. Like yeah. There's a See, I don't, that's the thing. It's people who've been taught that and it's been ingrained in them from their birth, you know, whatever tradition. It's also ingrained in people who later came into this theology because they wanted an answer. Mm -hmm. And for many Protestant traditions, uh, what we have said is, we don't know. Jesus says, I'll come when I come. You won't know. You might, you don't know when the thief in the night comes. You won't know when I come back. And so what I was always taught is, we live in the anticipation of the second coming. But we live now according to the tenets of how we're called to live together. And so I, we're supposed to love our neighbors. We're supposed to be kind. We're supposed to show compassion and work for justice and live in joy and hope and be thankful. And for me, it's Micah 6 8. <laughs> to seek question. justice, just say, to love kindness and to walk home with God. <laughs> And that is how we prepare for the second coming by being the people of God, right? Go ahead, sure. The, the slide before this one, oh, sure. the top bullet of the slide before this one, where it yep. said that you know we'd be separated and we would choose them. Like, where does one go to know what the Lutheran teaching is? Is it the Book of Concord or? Where there, do you there, find what places. the official um, Lutheran yeah, there, doctrine you, is? There um, are there Luther. Lutheran doctrine, you can find pretty clearly in some of the Augsburg Confessions, right? And you can find them uh, as um, you go to the ELW resources and you ask for doctrinal beliefs, uh, and they go through all the different iterations of where these things came from. Some of it was works of Luther, some of it was because it's you know, evolved since yeah, Luther, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's evolved, but there's some it's things. Matthew that we, 25. Yeah, but it's Matthew 24. That's what that was. Sheep people, and the goats. Yeah. And then you get to 25 and the sheep and the goats. There, there is imagery in there that we can use and say, yep, yeah, you're you're a goat, you're a sheep. <laughs> but there are not everybody who's a goat is a bad person. Yeah, Maybe they're yeah. born into yeah, sheep and goats are all of us. Yeah, I no, think there's, there's a little bit of that in all of us. Mm -hmm. So what I think is the second coming is going to happen. And we don't know when it's going to happen. And what I want to do is live today. Yeah. In joy and hope and anticipation. And when in Advent, whether it's four weeks or seven weeks, <laughs> we are prepared, right? We are prepared for the second coming of Christ because Jesus has already been born. Jesus has already done his ministry. Jesus has already died and been resurrected. We get wrapped up around the baby because that is sort of this thing that more culturally than religiously has, has evolved. Right. And, and it's more fun. And it's more, it's more fun. <laughs> and when we do the nativity play, it is a gospel puree. None of that story comes from one gospel. It comes from multiple gospels. Yeah. Just like rapture theology and end times theology, it comes from multiple sources that has been mashed together. And when you do that for a nativity set, and then you read the end times text for the first and second you know, uh, uh, Sundays of Advent, you're sitting there going, why aren't we talking about the baby? Why, why are we doing this, right? We do this because as Christians, we have been gifted with this life and know that there is a second coming and that in that moment, for me, folks who are faithful are going to be reunited with God. How that looks, I have no idea. What I know is that Cindy's mom died in February and I believe she is with God right now. Mm -hmm. and that she is enveloped in it's hard to to not do to anthropomorphize uh, god into a being but that god welcomed her in with loving arms whatever those look like and her energy went, was reunited with the energy of the divine being now other people think her body has gone up what i want to say is live like this Live like that second, that last slide. Mm -hmm. Live in hope. <clears throat> Live in yeah. kindness. Yeah. We just finished, uh, we're finishing uh, Crossan and Borg's First Paul. And they have a wonderful definition of eschatology. They say it's God's great cleanup of the world mm -hmm. where God, Jesus' passion was justice 
and um, and mercy. And how we work toward that is the is the realization of the second coming. Mm -hmm. They also in another book say, "Without us, God will do nothing." Mm -hmm. With us, yeah, you know, God will empower us. Yeah, there's a better phrase about that. Yeah. But the the idea that bringing justice and righteousness and putting people in the right relationship with God is the goal of this yeah. life and the, the world to come. Yeah. And it's happening now. Yeah. We just don't see it all. Yeah. And so it be, it, it's your frame of reference, right? If yeah. I, my frame of reference is fear, right? If my frame of reference is fear, judgment, death, punishment, exactly. and hell, if that's my understanding of the world in the end, that creates a very different reality than the other uh, hey, the other <laughs> uh, option, which is to live in hope. And to, to, to right. not be fearful, but to be hopeful and joyous. And, and it's two very different frames of reference. Mm -hmm. And if you live in one, your whole life is going to be different than someone who lives in joy. Mm -hmm. If I'm in fear, I'm in joy. Those two things, I'm always going to try to choose joy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There are times I get fearful. There are times I get sad. There are times I get angry. And there are times when I look at the world and I'm like, God, it's in such a mess, right? And then what do you do? I say, <laughs> I don't have control of that. That the job is already taken and I don't have the qualifications for it. Yeah. So my role is and to you stop and think, okay, what one piece can I do something about? Yeah. You know, can I knit a hat and give it to a homeless person? Can I, you know, mm -hmm. give food to someone? What's the one thing I can, that's how, I mean, that's how I deal with it. Yeah. I, yeah, I I want to continue to do good. I want to continue to make the right choices and to love people, and that's hard. And you will run across people from this perspective, that fear and judgment perspective, in your life, and those who live in joy and hope. And it's two very different ways of looking at the world. If I look at the world this way, and someone comes to me and said, "Here's the enemy. Who's this? Is who you know we need to get rid of." Um, According to multiple sources, Trump is by, is looking at uh, doing um, uh, applications uh, and he wants 50,000 people ready to go into government jobs mm -hmm. who all believe what he believes. Mm -hmm. And if they don't believe what he has uh, in his sort of statement, they don't they're not going to get a job in the government. Can you imagine 50,000 Trump devotees mm -hmm. coming into government at almost every level? Uh, that scares the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. Um, it's scared the hell of me. So, end times. <laughs> um, <laughs> something's going to happen. Something is going to happen. And I think it's based in love and grace more than I think it it's is. A I think it's going to be a, a miracle. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope this helped. I hope you're yeah, not walking with more yeah. answers. Uh, more questions than answers, but uh, yeah, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, for, thanks for making an appearance. I told Cindy, I said, I don't want to be at home. I want to come.